invite you to turn in it with me to Matthew chapter 2 and reading verses 1 to 12. And I'm titling my message, Three Types of Seekers. Three Types of Seekers. I was in a conversation with somebody last week after church who mentioned how oftentimes it's the case that over the course of the Christmas holiday, the Magi get left out of the story. And uh, I thought about it a little more, and I was thinking, you know, you might be right about that, because if um, Christmas is close to the next Sunday, closer to the next Sunday than the previous Sunday, then oftentimes the things that happen on, like, the Christmas night don't get talked about near as much. So the Magi, uh, the wise men, as they're called, they sometimes just get left out of the story. And then I thought about it a little bit more, and I remembered, oh, yeah, actually I preached about that at the Christmas Eve service last year when there was a major storm where we only had about 13 or 14 people that were able to come. So what I'm doing here is I've kind of reworked the message from that service to uh, then give it uh, here as well. And uh, we're going to uh, be noticing in our text here with the wise men, Herod, and some others, three types of seekers. And this is, when I say seeker, I mean people who are seeking the Lord. Talked at Christmas Eve service about the glory of Christ, uh, his nature as the Lord of all, and how people should seek him and pursue him. Here we're going to talk today about three types of a seeker. So Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. Now, after Jesus was born, I don't think I mentioned this. That's on page 509 if you're using a pew Bible, 509. So Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, that is magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. This is from Micah 5. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Keep that in mind. We're going to be returning to that here in a few minutes. Shepherd my people, Israel. Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they'd come into the house, they saw the mother, the young child, excuse me, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. This is the word of the Lord for us today. We're thankful for it. Okay, verses 1 and 2, we have the Magi, these wise men as they're called, Let's be very clear here. They are not wise in the biblical sense. Um, these are astrologers from the East. And uh, these are men who have the abilities, as it's thought at least, to look at the stars and discern messages from the stars about the future. Astrology is something that is still alive and well to this day. Uh, you can read the newspaper and find your you know, astrological signs or whatever it is. That's what these men are experts in. They're from the East, where it's thought that the best astrology was, and um, they're pagans. I'll be very clear here. These are pagan men. But they do have a very clear purpose in the story. God wants to bring them to worship his son uh, when the son is there as a baby because he wants to show from a very early age that this is the one to whom the nations come, just like the, prophet, the prophets, I should say, promised that they would. But at the very least, that's what they do. They come, and they want to come and worship him 
as the king of the Jews, it says there in verse 2, and to bring gifts to him uh, in a very similar way that it says back in 1 Kings that the queen of Sheba came to see Solomon in his wisdom, and she brought gifts to him as well. Well, that same promise is made about the descendant of Solomon, who's going to come all those years later. People are going to come from the nations to bring gifts to him as well, and that's what they're going to do uh, right here. Well, when Herod hears about all this that's going on, he's terrified. You might wonder why. Why is he so afraid? Because kings were always afraid of any possibility that their reign might be in jeopardy. And so we think about Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams all the way back in Babylon all those years earlier, hearing about how his reign might be in jeopardy. Similar thing here with Herod, that there is this king of the Jews who is being born who might challenge him. So in verses 4 to 8, he asks all the scholars in Jerusalem where this child is to be born. They tell him from Micah that it's Bethlehem, David's town, the town that David was from. And he sends, Herod does, the wise men to go and to locate this child so that he can go and worship him, he says in verse 8. But we know that Herod is lying. He doesn't want to go and worship this child. He wants to go and kill this child. And so later on, when he realizes that he's not going to be able to do this in verses 16 to 18, you're going to find that in a fit of rage, he's going to kill all of the sons of Bethlehem and the surrounding region in a fit of rage, just a terrible, terrible ruler uh, that this man is. But going back before, in verses 9 to 10, that star that was in the sky that was leading these magi from the east to the west leads them all the way to Bethlehem. Notice the gracious condescension of God here to meet with these guys on terms that they would understand. Um, he doesn't convert them. He doesn't give them a knock them off their high horse moment like he gave to uh, Saul uh, when he was on his way to persecute Christians, but rather he leads them in terms that they would understand. They're astrologers. They look to the stars for messages. And so what does God do? He gives them a star. God's so patient. He's so merciful so gracious, leads them, and eventually they get there in verse 11, and they arrive there with their gifts uh, that they're going to present to this child who is laying in a manger. And I just want to say as a passing comment, there might be some differences between sort of the traditional nativity set, how we understand it, and what actually happened historically. There might be some differences, um, but maybe I'll wait till next Christmas to talk about some of those differences. You got to come back, uh, come back then, or just look it up online. Or ask me about it later on, and I'll show you some resources. There might be some differences, but at the very least, what we know is that it's a very, very humble, uh, mean estate, as one of the old uh, hymns says, that they're going to find this child in uh, when they see him. And they're going to offer their gifts to him, like they said that they were going to. Let me just read you a verse here out of Isaiah 60. Um, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. I'm just going to read it quickly here. In the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, when it's talking about the light coming into the world, and the glory of the Lord rising upon the people. In verse 6 of Isaiah 60, it says that the multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, that is to say the people from outside of Israel are going to come. All those from Sheba shall come, and they shall bring gold and incense, and shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Sound familiar? It should. That's exactly what's happening when these wise men, as it were, come to worship this child. Isn't this remarkable there in verse 11? They fell down and they worshipped him and opened their treasures. It's exactly like God promised that it was going to happen. Now what I want to point out to you, what I want to posit to you, is that we have three types of seekers. That is to say, those who were seeking the Lord. Three types of them in our text here. First, we have the Antichrist seeker. That's Herod. He wants to seek after Christ for what purpose? He wants to kill him. And I'm using Antichrist here as an adjective, which I think is a, lot, is a little bit closer to how the Bible uses it than uh, how some works of Christian literature of the last 60 years often use it. Uh, it's an Antichrist spirit and attitude, and that's what's driving Herod. Yeah, he's seeking the Lord, but he wants to kill him. Second type of seekers are the consumers. This might be a little bit surprising to you, but I submit to you that it's the three magi. They're consumers. They might, as far as they know, have somewhat decent motives, but let's be honest, they're pagan. 
And they might go to him and they might worship him, but when the show is over, what are they going to do? Verse 12, they're going to go right back home. They're going to, they're going to not go back through Israel. They're going to escape uh, going through uh, Herod's area, and they're going to depart for their own country another way. When everything is over, they just go right back home. Everything is just back to normal. And then thirdly, the third type of seeker we have are what I'm calling kingdom subjects. And you might say, well, where are they in the story? They're there in verse 6 when that Micah passage is quoted. When it says that out of you shall come a ruler, Bethlehem, who will shepherd my people, Israel. The kingdom subjects are those who are going to look for this ruler to come and shepherd them, and their ears are attentive to whatever it is that he's going to have to say. So what I want to do with the rest of our time here is I want to talk about these three types of seekers uh, that we see in our text. First, the Antichrist seekers, who are very somewhat similar, I should say, uh, to Herod here. Antichrist seekers. To be very clear, biblical anthropology is jarring in its lucid negativity about humanity's attitude toward God. It's jarring how lucid it is and how negative it is about man's attitude toward God. The irony here is that the title of my sermon is Three Types of Seekers. That is to say, those who are seeking the Lord. And yet, what does the psalm say? Psalm 53, the Lord looks down from heaven to see if there's anybody who seeks him. and They've all turned aside. Together, it says they become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. You can read in Genesis 6 and 8 about how evil is in, the heart, is in our hearts from the time that we're a youth. Um, sin is in us from the time that we are just little, little babies even. And can I just say, as a dad of little ones, I'm seeing it all the time, all the time in my kids and all the time in the mirror as, I'm, as I see even myself. But it's all over the place. The problem is so bad, and I don't want to belabor text here. The problem is so bad that John the Apostle tells us at the end of John chapter 3, which has probably the most famous verse in the Bible in it, but at the very end of the chapter, he says, whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but whoever doesn't believe, the wrath of God remains on him. This is saying that in some way, the judgment and wrath of a holy God is on us before we even make a decision about whether or not we believe in Jesus. That's that's a jarring statement. It's a little bit of a shocking idea uh, that the Bible gives us about the state of humanity's attitude before God. But let's be honest, it's like a doctor with a, with a hard-to-hear diagnosis. But if you've got some kind of cancer or some kind of horrible illness that needs treatment, what would you rather have? A doctor who's going to tell you something you want to hear or a doctor who's going to tell you what you need to hear? That's the way that God is in his word. It's offensive to us, perhaps, to think about, but it's what we need to hear because then and only then can we start from ground zero and then begin to begin to think clearly and rightly. Remember, I was uh, listening to a, a podcast about a year or so ago, John MacArthur, uh, America's favorite pastor. I'm just kidding. He's uh, criticized by a lot, in some ways, rightly. Um, but uh, MacArthur, he's on this podcast, and uh, he's presenting the gospel to this uh, individual who's not a Christian, and uh, the person responded by saying, aren't you afraid that what you're saying might be considered offensive to uh, some of your listeners? And MacArthur responded in a way that only he could. He said, I want to offend everybody. That's what I'm after, is offending everybody, because that might mean that it will jar them into hearing and considering the truth of these things. I don't think he's trying to be offensive just to be offensive, but again, when we deal with what the Scripture says about our heart attitudes, it is difficult to hear. We can be as winsome as possible, and I think we should. I try to be as winsome as possible every time I open the Scriptures with anybody, but at some point, they've got to, they've got to deal with the hard truth about, about our attitude before God. So that, let's be clear. Scripture is lucidly negative, and it's a, it's a look at man's attitude toward God. But some are indifferent, while others are antagonistic toward him. Many are indifferent towards God, many are antagonistic. And these antichrist seekers that I'm talking about, following Herod, are those who are antagonistic. 
They do everything that they can to try to stamp out the memory of Christ from the earth. All of their thoughts are the same as the rabble in Jerusalem when Jesus was being tried, when they cried, away with him, away with him, away with him. So the, those who were anti-Christ seekers are trying to do, they want to just do everything that they can to get the Lord out of here. Essentially, what I would suggest is that they want to live in his world without his rule. You might say, well, pastor, they don't think that this is his world. That's why they don't want to live according to his rule. And I would say, well, that's fine. I get it. They're wrong. Because the facts of history show that it is his world and that it belongs to him. All I'm doing is telling you what Psalm 2 says about how the nations, the nations put themselves against the Lord and gather together, and they try to break off the cords of the Lord from them and do everything that they can to rebel. And what does God do? Does he sit in the heavens and say, oh, man, I wish I could do something about this, but free will, can't move him. No, he sits in the heavens and he laughs. Because who do they think they are? It's stupidity. It's rebellion against God. Humanity is in rebellion against God. I don't know people's individual motives. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with each individual person. But what I do know is that if I see parallels between what's happening around me and what the Scripture says about people and their natural proclivities with the Lord, I really don't have to think very hard about it. I don't have to try very hard to diagnose what's going on. This type of Herodism, and that's my coined word from the message today, Herodism, uh, this type of Herodism that we're talking about is seen in persecution throughout the world against our brethren. We see it in we see it actually all over the world in different countries where there's great, great persecution, very difficult to be a Christian uh, in these uh, areas. Some are killed, some are hurt, some live under the threat of, uh, of hurt, whatever it is, because people don't want, don't want to let Christ persist in their midst. It exists also in the stamping out of the Christian worldview that's been so prevalent in the West for so long. Um, and uh, there's an attempt at sort of cultural revolution happening in the West right now. People talking about injustice, but then wanting to replace one injustice with another injustice. They say that it's about justice. That's not really what they want. They want revolution. Instead of accepting that the Lord is the one who's in control of history and time and space, and he says, blessed are all those who wait on him instead of taking the bull by the horns and bringing about change. Let me be very clear here. Are there injustices in our society? And is America a perfect country? Of course not. All kinds of issues. Unless Jesus is building it from the ground up and people are submitting themselves to him, builders labor in vain. That goes for families and businesses and countries. But at some point, we have to accept Again, that he's king of kings and lord of lords, and he's in control. And I need to humble myself and simply wait on him. But instead, what people are doing is attempting to not just passively run from the Lord, but seek out areas where the Lord is so that they can stamp it out and try to stifle it. Kill Christ, essentially, as Herod did. The second group that we see here, the second type of seeker, is the consumers. And again, I told you that this is like the Magi in our text. They bring these gifts to the Lord. They worship the Lord even. There in verse 11, they worship him. It's remarkable. But they don't stay. And there's no evidence, based on what I know, studying the history, there's no real evidence that they were converted by what they heard from the angels. And that the grand story, the grand redemptive narrative that is God's word got a hold of them. There's no evidence of that necessarily. And this is like this is like coming to the show when it's on, but then when it's turned back off, going back as though nothing ever changed. This is like also perhaps being um, a bandwagon fan of a sports team. We're in the midst of that time of year where you have like several different sports leagues going on at once. So you hear this all the time when you have teams that are doing really, really well and then they get all kinds of bandwagon fans. They're consumers. Um, you know, a lack of commitment. And it's sports. It's, it's arbitrary. It doesn't really matter what people do. 
But this is similar to uh, what's happening with the Magi. Yeah, they're drawn. Yeah, they have a, a, a purpose in the story. But again, when that night is over and when they've presented their gifts, they're right back out of there, back to, back to normal, the way things were before. I would suggest that there's a parallel to today, Christians who are Christians in name, perhaps would identify as Christians on a poll if they were asked, and would maybe champion their Christianity when it's more popular in society, or perhaps when they're more just in rhythm, uh, in church attendance and in observance of things that have to do with the faith. But there's a shallowness to it. There's a shallowness to it that can be seen in three ways. First, when the team begins to lose. I mentioned how you have some bandwagon believers. Um, when the team begins to lose, that is to say, maybe there's an influential Christian subculture for a time, and it begins to die, or a revival begins to tarry, they run. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that that's in many ways what has happened uh, in Western culture uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so, um, that influential Christian kind of subculture began to die, and now a lot of people have walked away from the faith that they once had. And the big idea that's now out there that you can read about online is something that's called deconstruction. And uh, many of you have probably heard this idea before, but what it is, it's essentially looking at the faith and the beliefs that I had at one time, and then not only asking questions about it, but, but pulling it apart kind of brick by brick. Not knocking it all down, but pulling it apart slowly. Deconstruction is something that's happening all over the place. I heard a, a preacher, a famous preacher here recently, talking about how if your deconstruction is a deconstruction of kind of a works-based um, societal influencing um, legalistic kind of faith, then I get it. But if you have life in Jesus, and if you really belong to him, that's not a faith that ever gets deconstructed. Real Christian faith, Jesus is your life. Your life is in him, he's in you, you're in him, and the glory of God in his face so grips you that while you might be jarred by what's happening around you, it never is going to knock you off your feet because you have a sure footing in his hand as he's holding you there. I think that one of the things that's happening today is sort of a consumer church in America and maybe in many ways is what's dying. You know what I say to that? Praise God. It's wonderful. Because maybe what we're going to find is if we're not here for Jesus, there's no reason to be here anymore. Praise God. The thing that makes the church the church is that we belong to him. I guess, in other words, what I'm trying to say, the first way that you see shallowness in consumers is that when it's not popular anymore to be a believer, maybe it never really was, but remember the world that I grew up in where there was this kind of palpable youth group culture with the contemporary Christian music and all. It was almost popular, actually, to be a believer. When it's not popular to be a believer anymore, people run away. And you see this with Christian writers, Christian singers, all kinds of influential believers over the last 10 or 15 years have so deconstructed what they held before. Again, maybe it needed to be deconstructed, but they've run away and they've stayed away and they don't want anything to do with it. it demonstrates that maybe there was a shallowness that was there all along. Maybe another way that consumer shallowness is seen is when a hard word comes from God's word, their fangs come out, and they don't like to hear that hard word. Maybe a word about hell, maybe a word about the sovereignty of God's grace, or this is one that I'm seeing more often now, a word about praying for your leaders, no matter who they are. Oh, they don't like to hear that, because I don't like the leader. Maybe the last one, the one that's there now. The scripture says about your leaders, submit to them because they serve the Lord's purposes. You know who was leader when Paul wrote that? Emperor Nero. Not a good guy. Not the most godly emperor in the history of the world. 
and we are told to pray for our leaders. And that's hard. Let's admit, let me admit it. That's hard. It's hard when you don't, maybe you don't like, whether it's your governor, your president, whatever it is, it's hard when you don't like who's the leader. But as Christians, whereas we might have kings who are over us, we know the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I just wonder if there's a degree of shallowness uh, in many of our kind of consumer faith that doesn't allow us to be able to have that kind of proper attitude um, toward our leaders, even if we disagree with them and even if we think that they have some destructive ideologies and all of that. It doesn't matter. We are Christians, and we are called to do what our Lord tells us to do, which is to pray for and do everything we can to support leaders without supporting the sinful activity and behaviors. Finally, the third way that consumers' shallowness is seen is when the gravity of life pulls them away when they're in rhythm with the Lord. What I mean is maybe regular church attendance, maybe regular Bible reading, um, regularly in fellowship with other believers. There's discipleship going on. But just eventually, over the course of time, the demands of life, the cares of life, the concerns of this world pull them away. It happens, frankly, over and over and over again with people I've seen throughout the years in ministry demonstrating, again, a degree of shallowness. And the Lord has made us for more than that. And that's the third type of seeker. The third type of seeker. If the first one is the Antichrist seeker who wants to, who wants to kill the Lord, the second is the consumer seeker who is there when the going is a little easier, when it seems to be a little, again, a little easier to fit in. The third type is the kingdom subject. That is to say, those for whom verse 6 uh, is written, For out of you, Bethlehem, shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. This concept of a ruler shepherd Usually, those don't go together. A ruler is a sort of a high person. A shepherd is a lowly person. Throughout the Old Testament, God is looked at as both. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David is an earthly example of that, but generally speaking, because he starts off as a shepherd, becomes king, but generally speaking, they don't usually go together. In these new days, the prophets promise that there's going to be one who is both a king and a shepherd. And he is going to rule over a people, frankly, who want to listen to him and who want to follow him, who can't get enough of him, who live by his word, who eat out of his hand, and who trust in him and his goodness. These sheep are those who are tired of the constant ideological back and forth that goes on in the world constantly. The pendulum swinging politically, societally, culturally, whatever it is, they're tired of, of wondering, what am I supposed to think and how am I supposed to know what's true? They want to listen to the shepherd. They're ready to follow him. They have an ear for him. And that's what they're interested in more than anything. They're tired of what the British band Coldplay has uh, called a battle from beginning to end, a cycle of recycled revenge death and all of his friends. They're tired of that. And they're ready to listen to the truth. They hear people say that they just need to be true to themselves. And they say, no, I look at myself and I see that that's my problem. What I need is to look out of myself and have the Lord give me my life. And They're ready for that. Here's the thing. Everybody has some set of lenses that they're looking through. It's helping them to discern what's going on around them and inside of them. Everybody does. And I talk with my eighth grade students about this all the time. My whole class is based around a what's called a biblical worldview. That is to say, putting on the right lenses. And everybody has some kind of authoritative, irreducible minimum that's helping them, that is sort of their plausibility structure, as it were. It's either a cultural plausibility structure, that is to say, whatever is celebrated, in society, so I'm going to make decisions based on what's going to get me acceptance. Or it's family values, perhaps. Whatever my family thinks, whatever I was taught when I was growing up, some things not necessarily bad there. 
or its personal values, that is to say, my own kind of sense of independence and doing things like Sinatra said famously, my way. I want to get to the end and I want to say that I did things my way. Everybody's got a set of lenses. But the believer, this third type of seeker, these kingdom subjects, these are those who have the voice of their shepherd as their food. And that's their plausibility structure. The gospel is the standard that they use, whether they're looking at themselves, the world, their friends, their family, the news, whatever it is, all of truth is discerned based on something's relationship to the risen Christ. That's what a believer is. That's what a sheep is. They judge themselves, the world, the news by its relation to Jesus and his truth. And that is slowly but surely over the years becoming their instinct. It's hard to get there, but they're growing in that. I want to give you one example of this. This is from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 17. And verse 17 is actually a really well-known verse, but I'm going to show it to you here within context. This is the Apostle Paul talking about this kind of growth in making Jesus your lenses and that becoming your instinct. He's talking about that here in verses 14 to 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. He says this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer, excuse me, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now that seems like a little bit of a tongue twister kind of, but his point is that Jesus' death, the death of the Son of God at the cross, his resurrection, resets everything. It resets everything. There is a new creation that exists, and now things are kind of flipped on their head from where they were before. It, it's, it's changed how we think about things. And so therefore, he says in verses 16 and 17, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, the point here is that because of Jesus' coming into the world, living, dying, showing the way to God, everything is flipped on its head. Now we no longer think of Jesus as just another religious zealot, but we think of him as Lord. That means that we think of the world differently now, too. As we, as we think about Jesus different than we used to, now that changes how we think about the world as well. Everything is flipped on its head. Now he has become the standard, the lens, the filter through which we think about anything else. And what I'm describing is something that we need his help with, isn't it? Because nobody can do this. Nobody can do this perfectly. But it's something that has to be happening within us decisively more and more as the days go by. This is, this is what it means to be a kingdom subject. This is what it means to be a sheep following the shepherd. That's why Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And they'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. You also remember when Mary and Martha that night when Jesus is at their house, Martha's up serving Mary's listening. Martha says, Lord, don't you see how rude it is that my sister isn't helping me? And Jesus says, she's chosen the good portion. That's never going to be taken away from her. It's not that it's not good what Martha's doing, right? It's wonderful what she's doing, serving. But Mary needs to listen to the shepherd. And that's what she's chosen here. How about in John 6 when Jesus has been teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and it's a euphemism for believing in him, but it's not understood that way. And so the crowds, the multitudes, run away because they say, this man's crazy. And then he looks at the disciples and says, you want to go away as well? And they say, where else are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. You're the shepherd. We're sheep. Every word that you speak, we're, we're hanging on it. And it will be that way for forever. 
These are those whom the Lord refers to as his mother and his brothers. Remember when he's standing up in the house and he's got the full house of people and his mom and his brothers come to try to take him home because they think he's crazy too? They say, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And what does Jesus say? These are my mother and my brothers. Those who are doing the will of God. That is to say, those who are sitting down before me and listening to the voice of the shepherd. When we say Jesus is Lord, that is not only our confession, but that is our posture as well. So we have three types of seekers here. Those who want to kill Christ, those who want to maybe follow him when it's easier and more convenient, and then we got those who will follow him even if it means going through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you've heard the story before uh, about a man named Polycarp. He was a second-generation Christian after the apostles. He was referred to as an atheist. You know why? Because he didn't worship the gods, the pagan gods of the Roman Empire. So they thought, well, he's an atheist then. Little did they realize, actually, they're the functional atheists. Because he's worshiping the true God. They're the functional atheists. So when he was standing up before crowds and he was about to be tried and then killed, they were all crying out, away with the atheist, away with the atheist. And they asked him, what do you have to say? And he waved his hand to them and said, away with the atheists. (laughs) They asked him more, what do you have to say for yourself, Polycarp? And he said, 80 and six years have I served the Lord and he has done me no wrong. And he was martyred. That is to say, he said, my shepherd is my Lord, and he has never failed me, and neither will he. May you and I not give in to this heritism. May we not give in to this consumeristic tendency where we're using the Lord for some kind of high such that We follow him when it's easy, but if the going gets tough, we don't have any use for him anymore. But may instead live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God and find our very life in him because that is eternal life. And that's what he's come to give to us. Let's pray. So Lord, today, we thank you for your great patience your great kindness, and your great mercy towards us. As the old hymn says, we need thee, oh, we need thee, every hour we need thee. And as we learn every step of the way, as we're living, walking with you on this journey of sanctification where you're conforming us to your image and you are shepherding and leading us, oh, we learned that, oh, Lord, that we need you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. And I pray for your people here that you would keep us as your sheep and that when you return, we would be ready. And if we come to you first, that we would be ready then as well. You are our ruler and our shepherd. We are your sheep. May we follow you by your grace. Give us your spirit for all that we need. In Christ's name, amen.